before we have a break, a short break, we have um, Adam Kalai, who's a principal research scientist at Microsoft Research New England. He's interested in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and algorithms, and lately has also been interested in program synthesis, teaching computers how to program. Um, he, he's, he's won multiple Best Paper Awards, a career award, an Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship. He used to be on the faculty at both Georgia Tech and TTI Chicago and has chaired a number of conferences, uh, you know, New England Machine Learning Day, HCOM 2017, Colt 2010, et cetera. Um, actually, one of my favorite papers from Adam was, uh, I, I guess I, I read it when I was in grad school, this generating random prefactored numbers. So this was done in a PhD thesis and it was quite long. And then Adam had a nice paper in soda that was a page long. And actually at some point there was a little joke in there about, um, you know, see the following figure and it was a smiley face. <laughs> but, uh, so, okay, so Adam, thank you. Great, uh, well, thank you so much. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I wanna thank uh, the organizers of this event. It's really uh, been wonderful. All the talks have been so talking about like deep results summarizing a decade or more of interesting research. Uh, my talk will be the opposite. Okay, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna be talking about some recent stuff uh, and it's uh, inspired by the problem of, could we understand what whales are, are talking about, what animals are com communicating? Um, AI now translates human languages very well. Recent breakthroughs are making it better and better. Could we understand what whales are talking about? And this is coming from a question that, that came up at, a, at, a, at an event at the Simons Institute. Um, and it's kind of interesting because it's actually not, not exactly a theory workshop, right? It was uh, called Decoding Communication in Non-Human Species. It was held in 2020. And one of the great things about the Simon Institute events is that, um, well, they bridge theory and practice. So this event has inspired us to work on a theory of, uh, of this problem. And it was a, a practical event. And all the, uh, uh, all, I didn't attend this, but I attended it virtually much later by watching all the lectures that were excellent. So it's really been a, a great service in my opinion. And I know many people feel that way. And actually there's a big project that, that arose from that called Project SETI um, that is, you know, is, 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 has been well-funded now. And the idea is uh, to exactly to bring an interdisciplinary team together, including a bunch of marine biologists and uh, Shafi is a theory lead and, and it's uh, it, one of the supporters is the Simons Institute. So I think this, uh, this project, which is, uh, has a lot of momentum uh, owes a lot to the Simons Institute and Shafi for, for starting it. Um, okay, so, but uh, actually what I'm gonna talk about today is a general theory. It's not specific to whales. It could be applied to other animals, cows or whatever. So we'll, we'll see how, how uh, if it makes sense and, and, and what, what we can say about what we might be able to translate from animals. So first let's just talk about translation in general. Um, as you know, you know, I'm sure many of you use Google Translate. It works really well and it works by starting with, uh, among other things, it starts with the uh, data of, you know, labeled data in one language, say French and, and its translation in English. And these are it's called parallel data because you have a sentence and then it's translation and the the training data may be coming from some distribution mu and it's labeled according to some function well some annotators f star and you get the, their labels and uh, one thing to important to note about this is you you all know that there's more than one way to translate things right you might say look out there's a shark you might say there's a shark look out watch out there's a shark there's many different correct ways to translate things but that's okay that's not the biggest problem this works pretty well, as you all know. Um, in fact, the neural nets that they train on these things can, can learn the posterior. They can not only learn you know, one translation, they can learn the probability distribution over all translations, right? So, um, so don't be, I would say the fo our focus is not on the fact that there's multiple possible translations. That's a problem even when you have parallel data. Um, the computer can, the neural nets can, can handle that. Okay, um, and so this might work for very simple animal languages. So there's a researcher named Alexandra Green who studies cows and their communication. She spent months on the fields recording the cows and she believes that, that I'm not joking, the cows have two kinds of moos, a happy moo and a sad moo. Okay, and she can tell by what the cow is doing, whether it's a happy moo and, and sad moo. And so she's created an annotated corpus uh, and there's many ways to translate it, but she could use hooray and darn it or whatever. But anyway, I, and so this um, is working and you can, uh, you know, I think soon we will be able to uh, detect from the sound of a cow, uh, whether it's happy or sad. So I think this is feasible. Um, and you can even do it with labeled data is what I'm saying. She can label the data, you can have a human annotate. The challenge when it gets to a, a, an interesting animal like a sperm whale, is that we don't have any way to translate uh, their communication. And the biologists believe that they're communicating 
in very interesting ways. The sperm whale, they chose the sperm whale for this project because it has the largest brain of any animal. It's six times larger than the human brain. And there's all kinds of evidence, I don't wanna get into it, but um, that their communicate, you can watch the videos in the workshop if you want, they're really fascinating, that their communication is super rich and they're communicating across miles and uh, they have really rich social structures. And, and so we're, we're dying to know what they're talking about, right? But we have no idea. We, we, we just don't know what to put in here. I mean, you could have a biologist, I guess, put in, you know, I think they're talking about food here and I think they're talking about diving there. But then the machine learning model would just learn that same thing, right? It would just start predicting I think they're talking about food. I think they're talking, and it wouldn't get in into any of the rich things they're talking about. They really strategize. They need teamwork to defend against whalers, against, and they develop strategies and communicate them. So there, there's a lot of interesting things. We're dying to know what they're talking about. And we have no way of getting this. So they're basically, if we had a mermaid <laughs> who spoke, uh, who, who could understand the whales at least and uh, speaks English, then that mermaid could annotate some data for us, and that would probably be enough. Uh, even maybe a little bit of data would, would, be, would be enough to get a lot of these machine learning techniques to work. But we don't have a mermaid, okay, uh, as far as I know, until we discover a mermaid. Um, but we do have neural nets, which may be able to learn both of these languages and translate for us. So that's kind of the question. Um, and just in case you're wondering, you know, the, this representation here, you might have audio files. So in general, the translation could be from some binary data set to another binary data set, but or there's actually been a bunch of people who've already worked about on this and in the Simons Institute videos, I watched one, uh, they talk already about transcribing, you know, how can we transcribe the audio into some written form? Um, this has been studied a lot, uh, watch the videos, there's really interesting work on that. So let's just assume that we have uh, a text input for the whales and a text or whatever animal and a text output, but it, it could also work from audio. All right, so amazingly, this problem has already been studied um, by applied machine learning people for natural language. Even though we already have plenty of aligned uh, parallel data for say English and French, they said, hmm, what if we don't? Let's, let's, let's take a neural net and train it on, you know, one neural net trained on English and one trained on French, and let's see if we can get it to translate um, between these from piles of monolingual corpus. So you don't have any parallel data just from a pile of English and just from a pile of French. And um, the answer is that it actually works. So from an implied uh, point, point of view, there's, there's multiple papers by a group at Facebook and another group, and um, it, 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 it spits out, uh, you know, grammatical English that actually matches. You can look and see it's, it's pretty good, okay? Now, there hasn't been a ton of work on this because we have parallel data. It's not really as useful, but I think uh, Shafi's vision and the vision of many people on that project is, hey, maybe we can do something similar with whales, right? If we had a ton of data of whale uh, uh, whales talking. And um, in fact, they're collecting that data. They have microphones tagged on whales and they have different strategies for collecting uh, the whale data. So uh, that's exactly what they're working on. Um, similarly, people did this for programming languages. They took data and they trained it on Python code and separately on C++ code. And they're able to translate uh, from Python to C++ and it, it looks really good, it captures the essence, and sometimes the code often, the code even compiles and gives exactly the same answer. So it's, it's kind of amazing um, that that works. Okay, so that's inspiring. Um, now in this talk, we're not gonna do the practice, we're gonna ask the sort of theory question, hey, do we think this has a chance? Because they're invest, this was fun and might as well, but from, for the whales, you're, you know, there's a lot of money and, and work invested in this and collecting all that data. So you wanna have a sense, does this have a chance of working? Is there some, what, 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 uh, what do we think that, would this work at all? And what does it even mean to work? So um, we've talked about what unsupervised machine translation is when you get this two piles of monolingual data. And uh, I'm gonna talk oops, about the uh, information theory, uh, an information theoretic model where you have a prior over what you think the whales are talking about and an inefficient algorithm. And then I'll give kind of, um, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna make a, a toy model. It's not meant as a, as a realistic model of English. But it's meant as a, as a um, kind of like a random graph models you have, you know, where you want to understand the behavior of algorithms and you see how they scale the behavior as the language gets more complicated or uh, in, in a random graph, is there more and more nodes? This will be a toy example where it should work and we'll, we'll see how the parameters relate to each other, how, how long sentences we need and, and so on in order to translate. Um, so that's going to be our model. And, uh, and then after the theory, I'll, I'll show you a little bit about these language models that we do have, like GPT-3 and things like that. I'll show you how, they're, how you can use them in these very amazing ways. Um, okay, so, uh, so let me start with uh, just mentioning what is a language model. A language model is a distribution, uh, if this is over English, let's call it new, 
uh, and remember we're translating from X, which is Walish, to Y, which is English, we're going to make all our assumptions on English. We're not going to make uh, very many assumptions on Walish at all because we have no idea. <laughs> all right, so, um, so our, our distribution is over communications in English. And uh, new is a distribution. It has some parameters, actually. It's called them lambda. And so they choose these parameters. It's not important that you know this, but I just thought it might be interesting. Uh, you take a pile of English documents, y, y, y hat one, and so on, y two. And you want to maximize their likelihood, the log likelihood, which is equivalent to minimizing the sum of the negative log likelihoods of all of the documents. And the way they train a language model, this is useful to know, is they train it word by word. Basically, the job is to predict the next word based on the previous words in the document. So you take the whole web and you break it into words or even letters or something in between, and you just train it and, and you try to predict the next word. And these things get really good at predicting the next word, okay? So um, much better, I think, than in person. And lately, I mean, there's been uh, advances month by month, the new, newer and bigger language models are coming out. So um, now this sounds interesting, you know, you can generate, uh, you can predict the next word, but if, if you can predict the next word well, that actually means you can generate text from this distribution as well. So you can just generate word by word, uh, and these things are efficient and they do generate. And you can, so, that, so if, if they were trained on a pile of brilliant research papers by mathematicians, like the people here, then that would mean they would have to generate, if they did their job well, they would have to generate math, the papers as if they were written by mathematicians. If you started a paper, they would have to finish it. So it's a very, very hard problem, okay? This, this language modeling and these neural nets have hundreds of billions of parameters as I'll talk about, and they're doing pretty well at this and they're getting better and better. It's kind of scary. Okay, so let me talk, uh, before I get into those language models, because that's not really the focus, let me talk about the translation problem in our information theoretic model for the unsupervised translation problem. So we have, we're gonna define a loss function here. And this loss is kind of uh, gonna capture our ability to predict okay, the translations. So we, we have three ingredients to the loss. First, we have a translator, which is a function that maps Walish to English. I'm using Walish as an example, it could be any animal. Um, then we have, uh, so that's, and it's, we're gonna assume for this talk that it's one-to-one -one so that given the translation, you could go backwards and figure it out, um, uh, just, just for simplicity. Uh, we also have a distribution that we're gonna assume the neural that we've learned really well. Let's say, you know, if we've trained this thing, it's not obvious, but it learned English just from reading the whole web. Maybe if we give it enough Whalish data, it'll learn Whalish and it'll, it'll pass the Whalish Turing test. It'll have conversations with the whales. That's all great, but we won't know what it's saying. <laughs> so the question is, how are we gonna do that? Um, so, okay, so that's, uh, but we have this, let's assume we have this great model for Whalish, mu, and we have this great, uh, we're gonna have a probability distribution over English. Now, um, it's not gonna be, well, actually, it's specifically gonna be over what we think the English translations of Whalish would look like. It's not all, the, we could put, you know, GPT-3 here, but GPT-3 knows all the languages in the world. And it could, it would just start translating maybe to other languages and to thing monkeys and stuff. So um, we're, I'll talk more about this later, but just suspend your disbelief and assume that we have as input a, the, a great distribution over whalish and a good prior, not perfect, but a prior over what we think that the whales might be talking about, but in terms of their, its translation to English. So if we had a mermaid <laughs> who really knew uh, English and Whalish, maybe the mermaid, maybe every, not everything can be translated perfectly, but whatever the mermaid would translate, however, whatever we think that the mermaid would translate, we have a prior. What do we think the whale, what, what do we think that a mermaid would be writing down that we think the whales are talking about? Okay, and so um, the loss is going to be the uh, is going to be something that looks like cross entropy here. So we have the the our prior here, and we have the distribution over what we would get if we translated the whalish uh, the whalish messages by this function f. So we want to say is a function good or is a function bad? If we have two functions and we look at their translation, and one of them translates a whalish thing and says feet my Simon harmonica the that, that doesn't make any sense. And the other one translates it to something that we kind of think whales might be talking about, like you need to dive really deep for a squid now. Okay. Well, obviously the second one is it looks a little better than the first one. So, you know, uh, a human looking at a bunch of translations, could we say which one we think is the right one? And if we can do that, then maybe uh, our prior a GPT-3 or whatever this neural net can do the same thing because it's got a great prior over English. So it, it assigns probabilities we assign. So maybe it's gonna be uh, able to solve this problem. So what's a good prior? Well, we want something that when we translate the documents, so we take, so we take, a, doc, uh, we take a whalish message and we translate it by F, 
Okay, and then we get so this is the distribution of the probability distribution of translations. That's rho hat, our approximation. That should look like rho. These two things should be similar. Take whalish things, translate it by f. If f is a good translator, it should kind of match what our prior is. That doesn't have to be perfect, but it should match it. And you could use other, this is some way of measuring uh, dis difference, distance, but you could use a statistical distance or something else. But this one I think is very convenient. It's, it, it, it's well suited for language models because it says, look, whatever we translate, if we translate, if we take a whalish message translated by this F, our, our uh, prior shouldn't assign zero probability to, it shouldn't be something ridiculous that we think <laughs> whales would never say that. So that's, that's, uh, that's the idea, okay? And um, okay, so this is a very similar to cross entropy. Right. <laughs> Just to take off my shirt, we're doing, getting to the math. So, um, <clears throat> and uh, there's a few nice properties about this, uh, this loss. One is that you can break it up word by word. So another equivalent way to think, think of it is if you took all the translations according to your translator and you said, okay, here are the translations, how good would it be at predicting the next word of the translation? So if we said you need to, to dive really you know, our, our language model would predict a high probability on the word deep. So it'd be good. It'd be accurate at its predictions of what's being translated. That's one way to think about it. And another way uh, I'll just mention, which is equivalent, is um, it, you could think about the dissimilarity between the probability distributions over the actual whalish. And if you took, uh, if you took a tran if you took a something from our prior and you translate it backwards to whalish. You have this, that's why we're assuming the, the function's invertible, just, just mentioned. This is a dual interpretation. We're not gonna use it, but it's equivalent. It's nice to know that you could also look at the dissimilarity in terms of whalish, uh, what whalish you get. And if you took our prior and back translated it to whalish, how, how similar would those distributions be? Okay, and that's easier to write mathematically. But I think the first one is a bit easier to think about because um, this is, we're actually looking at English translations and our prior, so we can, make, we can make assumptions about English. We're gonna make some strong assumptions, but at least they're about English. We're not gonna make much assumption at all about Whalish, so that's, that's better. And in future work, you could try to make uh, weaker assumptions. We can think about that. Okay, um, so this also suggests an inefficient algorithm. In this talk, I'm not gonna talk about efficient algorithms. People, practitioners have algorithms, but what would the ineff inefficient algorithm be? Well, if there's some family of parameters for your models, you wanna minimize your loss, so this, this loss here, okay? And now it's important that we assume that there's some bounded models. The, this family, the size of this parameter space is going to be important. If we allowed ourselves to use any translation, do you, does anyone know what the best translation would be? If we, if we didn't restrict our translators and we said, okay, we have our prior uh, over English translations, and then we know the Whalish distribution perfectly, what would be the optimal way to translate according to this loss? No, oh, that's an interesting idea. You could ignore the input and output, but we're assuming we have a one-to-one -one deterministic translator, um, right? What is it? Yes, you, you take the most likely, you could, the thing that would maximize this is you take the most likely whalish sense and you translate it to the thing that's most likely under your prior and the second most likely, <laughs> which is a ridiculous uh, translation. It won't actually, you translate the second most likely whalish thing to the second most likely English thing. And that probably won't give you a very meaningful translation. And do you see what I mean? It would be the most likely whalish sentence corresponds to the most likely English sentence and the second most whalish likely sentence. That, that's not a good translator. We need to assume that there's a small translator. And so uh, let me give you some intuition for this. It's much easier to translate than it is to generate. Think about writing a paper with proofs and everything versus translating a paper, <laughs> right? If you just had to translate a paper, you don't really need to know math that well. You don't need to know how to solve problems. You need to know generate, you need a huge language model. And that, that's why these language models are huge. They have tons of parameters. Think about any word, the word shark. Think about how much you know about sharks. You know that sharks have sharp teeth. You know what they eat, you know where they live. All the, you know tons, dozens of facts about sharks just from the word shark. And, and uh, both the Whalish language model and the English language model need to know that. But in order to translate, you kind of just need to know how to say shark in both representations. You also need to know the grammar. But um, the reason that these language models have, 
you know, billions or trillions of parameters now is that they, they need to know so many facts about the world too. It's not a language model is kind of a misnomer. It really needs to know how to prove theorems. Well, not the Whalish one, but <laughs> it needs to know, you know, facts about the world that when you go, there's a lot in common we have with whales. We all know that, you know, if you go down, then you have to come up. We know all kinds of interesting facts about the world that we have in common with the whales. And so these both language models would share that. And the translator, we're going to restrict the size of the translator to be much smaller. Okay. Is that clear? All right, so, um, so here's our toy model. And again, this is not meant as a realistic model of English, but at least we're making assumptions about English and not about Whalish. <laughs> and it's sort, of a, it's a sort of an easy case where it would be easy to translate. And we're just making sure that it would be information theoretically possible and see how much information we ha would have. And again, remember the issue we're not focused on is the multiple possible translations. There's many ways to word something in English that are all roughly equivalent. That's, that's not the crux of the problem. The crux of the problem is that we don't have any labeled data. Okay, so what is our model going to be? We're going to start with a, a very simple model of English where we have a tree. So the first word is going to be one of some fixed number of possibilities. Like we're thinking of the set of, first of all, we're thinking of the set of plausible English translations of what the whales are saying. Should be grammatical sentences that kind of make sense. Okay, but it could be, we could have a very broad perspective. So the first word could be ocean, and the second word could be waves, and the third word could be break. That's a sentence. I'm just giving very short sentences. The first word could be sharks, the second word could be swim, the third word could be fast. So all the paths here, um, the set of paths here determine a set of plausible translations, okay? And any set of sentences or words of, let's say, uh, and, and any, any set of, let's say assume that there's K choices for the first word and K choices for the second word and so on. You could relax this assumption, but I'm just making a simple model. So that's this, this one we should, hopefully will be able to translate. And the length is the depth of the tree here. So there's N words, let's assume, and we're very curious about how many words we need in order to translate well. Um, so there's K to the N possible plausible sentences in our model. And the strong assumption we're making here, which is kind of ridiculous, but it, it, it's still, we should be able to translate in this case, is that the words on these uh, edges are all random. So we've got a, a set of random uh, plausible uh, translations. And this again is sort of like an Erdős Reni uh, or preferential attachment random graph thing. You know, if we have, if, if the set, we have some set of plausible things, any set of plausible translations can be organized in a tree where you just branch on the first word. And then um, we are going to assume though that those are random. Okay, the words on these things are random. And this determines a set of plausible things that the whales might be talking about. So we assume we have some set of plausible things, it's random. Okay. Um, and then, um, so these are the plausible translations. It's a subset of uh, English and English is a subset of words to the end, just for some set of words and you have N words. Okay. Um, and so one, one assumption we need to make is that the branching factor is less than the number of words over four, which is a very mild assumption. The number of words in English is like 100,000. The number of plausible words at any point is what's called the perplexity of a language, and that's around 20. So it's way less. Okay, that, I don't think that's our biggest assumption. Um, and then the, the other thing is the, uh, we're going to assume that the real translations, what the whales are actually talking about, is only is some subtree. Instead of using all K of these options, maybe they're talking about some little k options each time. So k, little k in this example is two. So you have three possible, you, you, you are open-minded and you think whales are maybe asking questions like do whales daydream? Um, but in fact, whales never ask a question. There's no way that they would ask that first word do. So there's some subtree and they're talking in the subtree. Basically a language model encodes all kinds of information about the world. And the way we're describing what it encodes about the world is through a set of plausible English sentences because meaning is very hard to represent. Okay, so this is the assumption that the words on the, this tree are random and that the subtree that the whales are talking on is also uh, random, which, which little k out of the k things it is. Little k obviously has to be less than or equal to big k. If it's equal to big k, life is great. Our, our, our set of plausible things that the whales might be talking about is all is exactly what they're talking about. That's great, um, but it might be smaller. And so this model will just denote, that's the only notation we have is this random language tree, okay, model, okay. But if we have a random language tree, we will be able, hopefully we'll be able to translate. So here's the theorem. So we have some family of uh, parameters for our neural nets, let's say. And we're, for simplicity, let's just assume that these uh, two, that the sizes of the uh, languages are the same. You could get that by padding. And then the theorem says with high probability over the random choice of uh, language for the, the random choice of plausible things that we might be talking about P, that we think they might be talking about P, and the things that the mermaid would translate them to are, <laughs> uh, if there's some good translator in our model, so we're assuming that there is some good um, 
parameter in our model, some good neural net, which has not too many parameters. Then, uh, and, and by the way, just that low parameter assumption could, uh, one way to make that is that there's some sentence by sentence translator that would restrict the number of translations. So if there's some good translator, if there's no good translator, we're in trouble anyway, then we're gonna have low error. And error is defined to be the probability that if we take a new whale sentence, our estimated parameters, theta hat, will give a different answer than the mermaid would, okay. Again, in this random model, there shouldn't be too many translations that for, for each, there should be just one translation for each thing, but we're gonna look at our error. And so uh, what is this theta hat? Theta hat is the thing that minimizes the loss. Um, we're assuming, first, let's assume that the distribution over the plausible sentences in our prior is uniform, and that the distribution over what the whales are talking about, uh, they're actually talking about is uniform over the back translations. So th this is where we're not making any assumption on the whales, we're just assuming uh, th that, their, that their translations look a certain way in English. Uh, it's also uniform over the subtree of whales. And then the bound we get here, let's unpack that. There's a number of translator parameters here. And then k to, little k to the n is like the number of whalish messages or something. It grows exponentially with the length. So n is kind of like a capturing the complexity of the language. The longer the language, the, the longer the sentences that we're translating, uh, if, if n is large, it means that each word is, it has some n new option, has some new op, k new options based on the previous n minus one word. So that would not work for cows, but uh, the, for a more complex language, it makes sense that the, each word uh, has some options that, depend, that are affected by the previous n minus one words. Um, so, so we are kind of getting what we expected, which is that, that uh, as long as the language is, as long as the translator is, is much easier, as long as translation is much easier than uh, modeling the language, we, we, are, we will be able to, to translate. Um, we, can, we can weaken these assumptions to just that the support of rho is actually the plausible things, and that the support of mu is, is somewhere over the uh, set of whalish translations, and we replace this one over k to the n by the maximum of the probability distribution. I'm really low on time, so let me just give you some cool examples of the language model. So just to show you language models, you can give them a prefix, and again, they, they predict the next word. So they'll generate from this prefix. So I gave it a prefix. Let's see what it does. So I said, here's what salmon eat. And can you tell me what I think you think sperm whales eat? And it just generated all this. And then it picks some more animals. So it really knows a lot about what, what animals are eating. It's not, uh, and this is from a GPT-3, um, which has 175 billion parameters. So we just gave it a prefix and it generates word by word. And it, you can check it out. It's pretty, pretty accurate. Um, they can learn from a single example. So you can give them some cute example here. I took a sentence and I just decided, oh, let's put moo between each word. That's not something I think they'll find on the web. And boom, you know, from one example, they learn. So language models are learners too, because that happens on a web page. Um, they can write your papers for you. You can just do, <laughs> uh, write something and they will complete it. And it's actually quite accurate. I mean, I, I went and checked this. This is a reference. This is an actual paper about whales do sleep half of their brain at a time. It's amazing. Um, uh, they can explain jokes. And so the way you do that is you, they, some, this is all human written. They gave two examples of jokes and their explanations. And then they said, do you see that Google just hired an eloquent whale for their TPU team? Now, many of you may not get that joke, but GPT-3 will explain it to you. <laughs> I'm not joking. The explanation is that TPUs are a type of computer chip that Google uses for deep learning. A pod is a group of TPUs. A pod is also a group of whales. The joke is that the whale is able to communicate between the two groups of whales, but the speaker is pretending that the whale is able to communicate between groups. Of it's, it's, it's perfect. It's a great explanation. It, understanding jokes is like the uh, hardest thing of understanding language. So these language models are really working. They can write code. Um, they, they have a prior, this is what I wanted to say, last thing I'll say, sorry, is that they have a prior, you know, I talked about having a prior over what we think the whales are talking about. Here's a one way to get a prior. You put in a little prefix and you say, here's what I think two whales are talking about. And GPT-3 has, you know, posterior over what it, it thinks two, two whales will talk about. And it starts generating conversations and it'll have positive probability on any conversation, but much more likely on conversations that are about krill and things that whales do. So this is real GPT-3. I just did this, you know, uh, recently and it, it's generating what it does. So, um, okay, so I, I guess uh, I will just go to my conclusions. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, we have an information theoretic model. It suggests that if the conversation, if the language is rich enough and the translator is simple enough, we will hopefully be able to translate. What's missing is um, this model, random models don't have any symmetries and real language has a couple symmetries like 
north and south. It may be very hard for us to translate. If we hear them talking about, if they had directions like north and south and we hear them talking about it, we might get that flipped. There are certain symmetries that are present in language, which the random model didn't capture. Um, we have a lossy model as well that I didn't talk about. And the, the other thing that I really think would be amazing is for really good translation, you actually want a background. So there's a lot of things, whales have some sort of social structure that we're unaware of, and maybe they play games you know, that, they, that they have that we don't know anything about. And if you translate it, we won't understand. So a great translation would have some kind of background book, little you know, section that you would read that would explain uh, the whole whale um, you know, social structure. And then you would read the translations after that and they would make sense. And in principle, information theoretically, the computer should be able to generate that as well as part of the translation process. Um, okay, we will not talk about efficient algorithms. So thank you very much. Um, so, Sean? Uh, so how much, like in the, the, uh, the example of translating C to Python or English mm -hmm. to French, how much uh, do you think it's ut utilizing the, uh, like the character as being English uh, and English is a romance? Well, it can translate between uh, like, um, uh, like Mandarin, Chinese, and English. It doesn't do as well, but it's still, they've done okay, an so, experiment. So you, so you, you can question. do like... They've done uh, parallel uh, Chinese yeah, yeah. or yeah. Mandarin to yes. English. Mandarin English translation it's has been still... Done. It's still reasonable, yeah. So, I mean, if we could get that kind of translation with uh, whales, that would be amazing. Plus, if the whales are swimming with their newborns, the, this project, they plan to, to kind of uh, track uh, mothers and their babies. Imagine that if, if the mothers are explaining to the babies, like we're getting a whole dictionary, if they're teaching their kids how to speak and we can translate some of it correctly, we may actually be able to learn the whole thing. So it's really exciting. Good question. Hey, Adam. So one question. It is conceivable that just like people living in different parts of the world, uh, also whales live in different oh, oceans. Yeah. They speak different languages. Yes. And translating between right. different whale languages, right. even without knowing what it means, is something that could be easier. Translating Presumably, the... they are talking about the same things. Yeah, yeah. You're we saying we could, we could help the whales by translating between different whale languages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they, this translation, so having samples from different... Uh, it, it, might, it, it might blow their mind. That's true. Uh, I, that would be very likely to work, I think. Um, there is evidence that the whales have different dialects. I mean, they know that. The biologists have studied that. And they, and they have tried to put... They know that different groups of whales with different dialects do not like talking to each other. We don't know if it's because... They don't understand each other or just because they're not interested? <laughs> Good question. Okay. Um, we are running a bit okay, late. Yeah. So I think I'm around if you want to ask a question. Yeah. Maybe at this point we can take a shorter break than planned, uh, maybe till let's say 335. Sound reasonable? So 335. <laughs>